Okay. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, thanks everyone for joining today. Um, my name is Sonia Dixon. This is a webinar on finding clinical trials. Um, it's through a consumer um, lens. And uh, hopefully you find the webinar useful and uh, either as a researcher or a consumer. And uh, before um, we start, before we really move on, I'd like to um, pass over to Sonia Shields to give it an acknowledgement to country. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sonia Shields and I am coming from um, Biripai country. Um, I'd like to first start with letting everybody know the difference between a welcome to country and an acknowledgement to country. A welcome country in most countries can only be done by an elder male. Um, there is a few countries where a female can, but as it's not a part of my culture and a part of my mob, so I only am able to do an acknowledgement to country. And I'd also like to acknowledge that yesterday was um, National Sorry Day, and today is, is the beginning of Reconciliation Week. And for Reconciliation Week this year, we're doing Be Brave, Make Changes. So on that, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of our land and our streams and our mountains and our rivers. They are the elders of the past and the elders of the present and the elders that are emerging. This has always been and always will be Aboriginal land. And we, um, I've lost my plot now. Sorry. Uh, and we welcome you from whatever land that you're joining us on today and thank you for your time. Thanks very much, Sonia. Um, I now just wanted to um, do a bit of scene setting um, for the people who are joining us. Um, this is brought to you by um, Conviction and I'll give you a bit of an understanding of who Conviction is and then I'll go on to the purpose of the um, webinar. So conviction is that late last year, New South Wales Health funded a project called Increasing Clinical Trials, Awareness and Participation in New South Wales. And the project team included Sydney Health Partners, Health Consumers New South Wales, Northern New South Wales Local Health District and Access CR. And they brought together an advisory group on health consumers to think about how to increase awareness and participation in clinical trials. The group that got together is about half and half Sydney and regionally based and has a diversity of backgrounds, including people from culturally and linguistically diverse and First Nation backgrounds with a range of ages, health experience and research experience. So we call ourselves Conviction, which stands for Consumer Voices in Clinical Trials in New South Wales. If you'd like any more information about this, um, group, you can contact Joan, Carrie or Janelle as listed on this slide. Now, just as to the purpose of this webinar, we did some recent work in this group to identify that finding trials remains a bit of a black box for people. Today, we hope to let the light in by sharing one person's experience of finding and participating in a trial. And that from that, we hope that you can get some strategies you can use to find clinical trials, should you be interested. Conviction wanted to run this webinar because we understand that a lot of people have trouble finding trials and don't really know what it means to take part in one. Equally, a lot of clinical trials have problems finding enough people, which slows down how quickly the research happens. So we hope today's conversation will help demystify trials a little from the consumer perspective. And for information for everyone, this is being recorded and the recording will be made publicly available along with the slides and a handout with some links to the places we will talk about um, today, later today, that you can go to for help. And we will sen send this out information out to everyone that has registered. So um, I'd like to introduce um, Vanessa. She um, has... A taken part in um, a, a number of clinical trials. But um, 
I just wondered, hi Vanessa, can you tell us a little bit about, about yourself? Hi, um, so um, I'm Vanessa. Um, when I was 20, I was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia um, and um, underwent an autologous stem cell transplant and then was the first adult in Australia um, to have a bone marrow transplant through cord blood. So this, that wasn't actually a clinical trial, but I did have to go through an informed consent process, which I think we might touch on a bit later today. Um, so I guess my background from there is that I went on to do uh, a PhD in immunology. So I have a lot of science background, but I've also been working in clinical trials for the last eight years. Um, so if I get too technical, just pull me up because I'm aware that um, this is, I'm giving you my experience as a consumer. And sometimes I, I do flip into my, um, my work role. So just, just pull me up on that. I think it's great to have both perspectives. So um, what led you to go look for a clinical trial, Vanessa? Uh, so the clinical trial that I was on, um, my sister actually told me about, she heard about it on the radio. Um, they were looking for um, participants for a um, trial to prevent um, COVID in cancer patients. So this was a nose spray. Um, and um, she was the one that told me about it. And then I went to try and look for how to register my interest and how to become involved from there. So it wasn't a, a life or death clinical trial. Um, and it was more it was more the preventative pre uh, prophylactic type of trial to help other people. Um, so have you got any more information about how you can go about finding a clinical trial? So it was interesting for that particular trial because I actually found it quite difficult to actually register my interest. So I registered on their website. Um, I do know that there are registries that you can look for clinical trials. Um, and um, sometimes these can be confusing. Sometimes you can end up with hundreds of clinical trials and sometimes none, just depending on your search criteria. Um, the way that I ended up being on this clinical trial was actually through some of the resources and people that I know. Um, I reached out to some study coordinators or study nurses from the hospital um, and then actually got in contact via a family contact who is a hematologist there. So I guess in my in my case, it was it was more the who you know to how, how to get onto the trial. Um, but once I'd, I'd made contact and set up the first meeting, um, everything went smoothly from there. Fantastic. Can you tell us what happened um, once you finally got in touch with the research team? Yeah, so the first thing they did was sent me out um, a, an information sheet. So I actually have it here. Um, and it was emailed to me so that I could read through everything that was required of me, everything that, um, all the visits that I would need to do um, and, the, the study drug and, and what its aim was for. Um, and this way I could then go and ask my friends and family. Um, I do have doctors in my family, so I went and asked them for their opinion. Um, I am a scientist, like I said, so I could look up what the study drug was and understand it from a scientific point of view. And I understand that that's not everybody's experience because not everybody's a scientist. Um, but you know, you can find out more information and you can ask um, your family and friends and your GP um, if you need more information. And from there, we organised a screening visit, um, which I went in and then went through the um, informed consent process. So this is when I uh, talked about it with the uh, principal investigator or the study doctor um, and went through any questions that I had. Um, and, and then from there, we signed. I signed the informed consent form and then we could go about taking any samples that are a part of the, the clinical trial yeah. and so then the study drug. Yeah. With your amazing background, what sort of questions did you ask and um, were the research team helpful in answering? Yeah, so I guess I, I didn't have that many questions because I do come from that background, but there are questions that I know that, um, you know, when I've asked friends what they would ask, um, it was more like, how does the study drug work? What happens if I miss a dose? What happens if I take too much? Who do I contact? Um, what happens if I get one of the side effects or I get something else that's not listed in the usual side effects? What, um, what do I do to go about it? Um, and, you know, the, the study team, oh, oh, we changed view. Um, the study team were very good at getting back to me. And, um, and I know that from, from work experience, like, 
from my previous work in that if you do have questions that they can't answer, they will go to the sponsor uh, to find out more information. So you, you should definitely uh, get um, a response on anything. And as, as the participant and the patient, really your safety comes first and anything that you're concerned about should be addressed. Um, well, thanks. And what, so what was it like being on the trial? Um, it was actually very interesting to be a, to be on the trial from the other point of view. So my previous role was to monitor clinical trials. So I would go to hospitals to, you know, make sure that the protocol and was being run correctly and the participants were kept safe. So it's interesting to be the participant um, on this one. I actually felt quite, I don't want to say chuffed is the right word, but I felt like I was helping other people. The, the study drug wasn't really so much to prevent me from getting COVID, but to give more information to see if it could be a prophylactic um, medication to help prevent it in, in people who are severely immunocompromised. So as a part of my um, ongoing health um, journey after my transplant, I, do, I am moderately immunocompromised. Um, and so I think it was, it was knowing that I was helping other people in the, in the journey of the clinical trial, I actually did end up getting COVID. Um, and I did find um, I had a lot of support from the study coordinator and the study team there to try and get me on some antivirals on that point of view. So with the clinical trial in this particular case, um, um, I was blinded. So I didn't know if I was getting active study drug or saline, which is just um, because they need to be able to compare uh, between actual study drug um, and, and what's known as the placebo effect if you're not getting the active drug. Um, so I really felt like I was contributing back and that's really uh, what I've based my uh, professional career on is improving the lives of others through medical research and I really felt that in this case I was really putting myself um, forward to be a part of that um, directly. Yeah, it sounds like you had a really wonderful experience. Um, would you do another one? So I, I would consider it. Um, if I was to develop a new health condition tomorrow and, um, and there wasn't, um, and there, there were clinical trials out, I would look into them. It would really have to depend on what the, what the clinical trial was about, what the study drug or intervention was like. Not all clinical trials are medicinal. Some are non-pharmacological. So then there are some to do with exercise or um, other alternative therapies. Um, and it would really depend on where I was in my life as well. So at the moment, I am not traveling for work. I'm mostly working from home. The study drug that I took, the nose spray needed to be kept in the fridge. So if I was traveling a lot, um, this that might be an issue, just keeping it cold um, and not making sure it didn't freeze if I was taking it with me. Um, so it really does depend on a lot of things. And I think for me, um, I would definitely consider it, but I would need to talk to family and friends and, um, and GPs just to make sure it was the right thing for me. Um, I, I am aware of the need uh, for participants, but I'm also aware that really the participant and the patient comes first and patient safety is really first and foremost. And if you're not comfortable, um, you need to be able to ask the questions and be comfortable. To I was going to ask, yes, what, what you would advise for anyone that um, was considering um, a clinical trial or um, hadn't been asked to do a clinical trial before, what would be your, your advice to them? Yeah, so my advice would definitely be to ask questions. Um, you know, I, I can think of all the questions from my background, but I, I have a lot of science knowledge as well. So I think from, from my point of view, um, I know people to ask within the industry, um, but, you know, for people that don't, definitely ask your specialists or your doctors, as well as friends and family, because, you know, being on a trial can... It does involve often uh, visits to the hospital, which can be disruptive. Uh, so logistically, it might just might not be the right thing. Um, so there are quite a lot of things to take into consideration, but it is definitely something to consider, especially if you're, you've got a, a health condition that, um, you know, current management isn't, um, isn't working for you. Um, so it's, it's something to consider. Well, thanks very much, Vanessa. Um, just so that everyone knows, maybe if you have any questions that you want to um, provide to um, Vanessa, um, 
you can put it in the chat and maybe after we have a bit of a discussion about um, how we bridge the gap of finding clinical trials by talking to another member of our team, um, Janelle from Access CR, maybe then we can um, address those questions as we go. But um, as you know, as we heard, Vanessa um, heard about clinical trials through family and used her professional knowledge to reach out and connect with the research centre. So this insider knowledge is certainly helpful, but it's not always the case. So how would you find a clinical trial if you didn't have that insider knowledge? So that's where I'll just throw to um, Janelle from Access CR to share a few key resources with you to get you started. Thanks, Sonia. Um, and, and thanks, Vanessa, for, for sharing your experiences in a trial. Um, really great to hear. And, and as we heard, sometimes challenging to find clinical trials. And there's really kind of three strategies for finding clinical trials. You can ask and, and engage um, widely to try and find them. You can actively search for them and you can register in different places for them. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about each of those now. So where can you ask? Well, your doctor. We'd certainly advise talking to your clinicians as a first place to call if you're interested in participating in research. Just ask them, you know, could there be a research option for me? Um, they won't always be able to answer that question. Um, and sometimes they may say that it's, it's not a good idea, um, but that doesn't mean you have to stop your search. Um, there are lots of patient groups that also know about clinical trials. Uh, if you're not sure if there's a patient group that kind of is in your area, having a look at the Consumers Health Forum of Australia website, they list a lot of the patient groups on there. There are your social networks. So as Vanessa mentioned, she heard from family and friends. So it's not just all about your online social networks, it's your in real, re real life social networks. So your colleagues, your fam family, your friends, your, your sporting groups. It's surprising how many people would, um, can sometimes forward clinical trial opportunities to you. You often see them in the news. Um, there might be a story on, I don't know, ABC News about the latest trial that's just been opened or, or ads in um, newspapers and on social media. Uh, and you can always, if you're really not sure, drop us a line at Access CR and we'll help you um, start your search for a trial. In searching, there are there are um, local and international clinical trial registers. So in Australia, the register is called the ANZ Clinical Trial Registry. It's worth noting that these registers were set up for researchers to increase the transparency about the research that was going on. They weren't set up as a place for consumers to go look for clinical trials. So it can be a little bit unwieldy to, um, um, to search um, and getting the search terms right can be sometimes a little bit of a challenge, but um, they are there and they do hold all the information about the trials that are happening. Um, sometimes they're just not quite as up to date as you'd like. And of course, there's good old Google, which we're pretty, we're pretty used to using these days. You can also register in different places for trials. So the Australian government has a website called australianclinicaltrials.gov.au, which has lots of information for researchers and sponsors and consumers about clinical trials. And one of the features that they have on there is that you can set up an alert for clinical trials in a specific therapeutic area that you might be interested in. And if a new trial starts in that area, they'll drop you uh, an email to, to go and check it out. There are academic clinical trial networks as well all around Australia in different uh, therapeutic areas. And if you want to take a look at those, the Australian Clinical Trials Alliance uh, uh, has a website that lists all the different clinical trial networks that you can contact. And just for reference, all of these links that we've, we're sharing with you today, plus a few more, will be provided in a handout that we send to you afterwards. So uh, you don't have to um, worry about trying to access the links at the moment. There are lots of companies that run clinical trials and they'll usually have a listing somewhere on their own websites about the research that they're doing as well as many hospitals and medical research institutes. So you can do a little bit of search about your local area and see what research might be happening. And there's lots of trial matching organizations. So these are organizations that are often um, 
uh, working with research groups and organisations to find people for their clinical trials. And often you'll put in some details about yourself and, and through the different algorithms and the trials that they have on offer, they'll try and match people to that. Um, there is probably no one-stop shop for trial matching. Um, so just because you put your name down with one organisation, there might be others that you can also put your name down at um, to broaden the reach of where you might find out about trials. And we have our crew newsletter, which is a newsletter we send out fortnightly, which lists all the trials that have just started in the last few, uh, last two weeks on the ANZ Clinical Trials Register, as well as any trials that people want to advertise with us. So if you want to learn more about clinical trials, there are, if you Google, there are lots and lots of resources, lots of videos, lots of websites, um, both here and overseas. Uh, I'm going to share with you three good ones today um, that you can start your journey, but certainly there is lots, lots more out there. As I mentioned, there's the Australian government's website, australianclinicaltrials.gov.au, and there's a specific section on, on consumers and it tells you about trials and share some stories from people that have participated in trials if you'd like to learn more about that. Our regulator, the Therapeutics Good Administration, also has a website for consumers about clinical trials and that will share with you more about the regulatory uh, aspects of running clinical trials if you're more interested in learning that level of detail about them. For a simplified, frequently asked questions type information, uh, the Consumers Health Forum of Australia has produced a consumer's guide to clinical trials, which is available on their website as well. And, and I guess my big thing is if you don't ask, you don't get. So if you're interested in participating in research, be proactive and start to ask the questions. So with that, I'll hand back to you, Sonia. Thanks, Janelle. I hope that's um, uh, it's comprehensive, comprehensive to me. So I hope that is to everyone. Um, but I'm just wondering, um, Carrie from um, Health Consumers New South Wales, do you have you noted any um, questions, burning questions um, in the chat? Yeah, there was one question um, uh, about, you know, I think this is for um, Vanessa about, you know, how would you feel if you um, were applied for a clinical trial and then you were uh, rejected or not, not accepted into the clinical trial? Yeah, I guess um, also with my, my background in clinical trials, I, I wouldn't be personally offended, um, but it's good to know that actually there are what's called eligibility criteria. So there are inclusion and exclusionary um, aspects um, to join a clinical trial. And really these are based on patient safety. So for example, um, a lot of clinical trials are not in uh, women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. And this is really to keep the patient safe. So if you were rejected, if I was rejected from a clinical trial, I could ask why, like what, what specific um, point in the eligibility criteria do I not meet? Um, and then it's, it, I guess it, to, the point is not to be disheartened. You're not going to be um, ineligible on every trial. So to to basically look, um, to ask the questions why, and then in um, if you do go for another one to see um, also what, what their recommendations are. So some of these uh, criteria are things like blood blood result ranges and things like that. And so really it is, um, it is, it is for me, uh, being a participant, it's heartening to know that they do do these checks and balances and to make sure that I'll be safe on a clinical trial, as safe as, as they can predict. We've got a question here in the chat box. Um, what can go wrong with a clinical trial and what kinds of risks can there be? This might be for Vanessa and or Tanel or Sonia. Um, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about the one that I was on because I can speak from a personal point of view on that point. So in the um, information sheet that I got, um, they do list the, the risks, um, the side effects that they are expecting. Um, so this included things like nasal irritation and nasal drip because I was taking a nose spray. Some uncommon ones were loss of appetite and weight loss. And I guess these, um, for me, highlight the things that I need to look out for um, when I'm on the, on the trial. Um, and so I know um, for the trials that I've monitored and for the one that I was on, I know that all the, the risks, the side effects um, and what we call adverse events are listed 
um, for the participant to understand and know. Um, I'll pass on to Janelle for a... Thanks, Vanessa. I think, um, you know, Vanessa's pointed out the really important thing, which is that patient information sheet that you'll get right at the start of the study that talks about the specific risks of a study. And it's really important that you just make sure that you know what might happen and what to look out for. And then if something does happen, how you'll be cared for. So who do you contact for help um, and what care is there to support you um, in the event that um, you have something go wrong? I think it's also worth thinking that sometimes things go wrong because you forget to turn up to a visit or you um, you lose your medication. Like there's, there's other things that can go wrong in a study, but always keep an open line of communication with the research team. They're there to support you. They're there to um, help you and to figure these things out with you. So having that really open line of communication with the research team is always important for, you know, just making sure that you feel happy to be in the trial. And just, we've got two more minutes. So just the last question, I note that we've got a lot of um, researchers, some researchers on, on this webinar, which is great. But what suggestions do the consumers have um, on this uh, for helping researchers find patients to participate in um, their trials? So do you, do you want me to... Yeah, Janelle. That one? Or Vanessa, yeah. do you want to have a go from the consumer perspective on that? How, how would you find you well I guess for me what was interesting was that when I went to the hospital they actually had posters up about the clinical trial that I went on but I wasn't going into the hospital because I'm 23 years in remission um, so I, I think that reaching out um, by some um, so I am part of the late effects clinic um, at that hospital um, and that would have been good a good way to reach out to reach the people that are, you know, have had cancer, but are a fair way out. Um, I think also reaching out through, um, um, what do you call it? Um, support groups, patient support groups um, as well. And I know that um, with anything that I'm doing, everything needs to go through ethics to make sure everything that is advertised um, is has ethics approval and things like that. Um, I guess, sorry, I just wanted to, to mention something that I don't think we've covered in that um, if I was not comfortable at any stage in the clinical trial that I could withdraw um, and I think that's really important you as the participant have the ad, um, agency um, to do that and you know you it is nice to let them know why um, but um, it is it is you know it is your it is your it is your safety and your um, how comfortable you are it's your comfort level as well. Thanks, Vanessa. I might just hand back quickly to Sonia because we're at one o'clock. Um, and while, while I'm doing that, um, I'm just going to launch a little poll. We really welcome your feedback. Um, so I'll launch that. And um, I'm sure the, the people leading the conviction group want to know more about what you'd like to hear. So I'll just do that and hand back to Sonia very quickly. Just want to say thank you for everyone for um, taking the time and attending. I hope it was helpful for you. And I um, really strongly um, recommend getting in contact with the, um, the people and, the, um, and accessing some of the resources that were provided. That, those lists of resources will be made publicly available post the webinar and all attendees will be provided with a link. Um, so yeah, I hope that you all got some um, really good information out of this and we could be helpful to um, both researchers and consumers. Thanks, Anya. So thanks everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, see you all later.